Through the haze of time gone by and a loose spliff or two, came one of the first sitcoms to take a nostalgic look back at the 1970s. With a knowing laugh at the fashion and trends of the day, that 70s show served as a reminder of how things had changed over the last two decades, and how much had stayed the same. When it debuted in 1998, the series was an instant hit, becoming one of the breakout comedies for Fox in the late 90s, and launching the careers of its cast. Many shows have imitated it since, but the unique chemistry of the characters and the inventive style of its production made it a tough act to follow. The idea for the series began with a business meeting at the Carsey Werner Company, a production company that had been responsible for such hits including The Cosby Show, Roseanne, and Third Rock from the Sun. During the meeting, it was suggested that they should start focusing their attention on producing a show for men from ages 18 to 49. Karen Mandebach, who was working for the company, was struck with a sudden inspiration how to appeal to 18 and 49, and I literally did the math and my head went, go back to 1976. Mandebach pitched the idea of doing a show set in the 70s to Bonnie and Terry Turner, who had recently created Third Rock from the Sun for NBC. The husband and wife duo teamed with writer Mark Brazil to create a pitch for what would eventually become that 70s show. The series drew heavily from the lives of its creators, hearkening back to their days growing up in the 1970s, though crucially what made the series what it was, was not its reliance on making references to the decade, but rather a memorable cast of characters who just happened to be living in the 1970s. Memories of the era would appeal to an older demographic, while the drama of the teens would appeal to a younger one. The show's creators produced a script for a series called Teenage Wasteland, and while it wouldn't keep that name, it did reflect the idea of a group of teenagers trapped in a small town with nothing to do but hang out. Set in the fictional town of Point Place, Wisconsin, shows were less about cheering on the Packers, although they did that on occasion, and more about creating a dynamic that was driven by its characters rather than its premise. Topher Grace was chosen for the role of Eric Foreman through an odd twist of fate. He was starring in his school's production of Our Town with the daughter of the show's creators, Bonnie and Terry Turner. He impressed them so much, they brought him into audition and he got the part. The character is loosely based on writer Mark Brazil. Eric is an awkward everyman teenage boy in love with the girl next door. What are you talking about? All she said was that she'd be alone Saturday night with a pizza. Oh god, I'm so stupid. <laughs> Laura Prepon played the role of Donna Pinciotti. Prepon was working as a model before trying her hand at acting, and she turned out a movie role after becoming enamored with a part of Donna. Donna is the tomboy of the group, with dreams outside the small town of Point Place. She's also exploring her feelings for her neighbor Eric. I know you're going for the bra. <laughs> how, how did you know? It's just every time you go for my bra, your lips stop moving. <laughs> Ashton Kutcher took a direct route to his role of Michael Kelso. He had been working as a model for about a year and was incredibly lucky with one of his earliest auditions being for Teenage Wasteland. He was immediately a favorite of the show's creators. Kelso is the handsome, yet deeply naive member of the teenage group of friends. I guess I will have to do something stupid. <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> I know something stupid we can do. Danny Masterson was cast as Stephen Hyde. He had been performing on stage since he was eight, when he had a role on Broadway, and had since gone on to appear in hundreds of commercials. His input helped define the character, giving Hyde a harder edge. Hyde is the street-smart troublemaker of the group. He has a healthy distrust of authority and an even healthier stash of pot. Hey, how do you get the beer out? <sighs> Through the tap. What tap? <laughs> Wilmer Valderrama was cast for the role of the foreign exchange student Fez. Although born in Miami, he grew up in Venezuela, giving him an authentic accent that made him appeal to the show's creators. Fez is the perpetual fish out of water, taken under the guidance of his new American friends. Although we never quite learn where Fez is from, or what his name even is, he's still embraced as part of the gang. We gotta do something that says we will not pay homage to a corrupt electoral system. I know, a bloody cool. <laughs> Mila Kunis was cast as Jackie Burkhart. Originally born in Ukraine, her family moved to America when she was seven, and she took acting classes to help with her English. She quickly found success with a number of parts, but when auditioning for the role of Jackie, which was looking for a 16-year-old, she lied about her age to get cast. I was 14 at the time, so I went in and they asked me how old was I, and I said I was going to be 18, which was the truth. Sooner or later, I was going to be 18. I just didn't specify which year. Jackie is a spoiled rich kid, only barely tolerable in the group because of for a romantic connection to Kelso. Hey, I give too. Every year my friends and I deliver gift baskets to the unfortunate. 
I think you mean less fortunate. <laughs> okay, whatever. Bumps. Deborah Jo Rupp was cast as Eric's mother, Kitty Foreman. Although a very experienced actress, she had largely been doing guest roles on shows such as Seinfeld or in movies like Big. Kitty is the picture-perfect image of a mother figure, holding her family together through freshly baked cookies and a well-kept home. Although she's not exactly a homebody, as she also works as a nurse to help the family through some tough financial times. It's a hot shave dispenser. Oh, he won't need that for a long time. <laughs> a long, long time. Of course he will. He's almost like a man. <laughs> <laughs> Kurtwood Smith was cast as Eric's father, Red Foreman, a longtime veteran of the screen. At the time, he was probably best remembered for his role in Robocop. Red is the perpetual hard-ass, determined to make his son into the man he expects him to be. When the show begins, he's struggling to put food on the table as his job as manager at an auto parts factory is in peril. Thank you, Pop. <laughs> Sir. Yeah, well. Clean the attic. <laughs> Don Stark was cast as Bob Pinciotti, Donna's father. Another prolific actor, he had appeared in numerous shows and movies in the years leading up to this role. Bob is the trendy appliance store owner next door who's not afraid of wearing his heart on his sleeve. Now the most important part of our presidential rally is the townspeople Q&A section. Uh, just so uh, everyone's clear, the Q stands for question, the A for answer. <laughs> Midge Pinciotti, played by Tanya Roberts, was the final member of the Pinciotti household. An actress plucked from the 70s, Roberts joined Charlie's Angels in the show's fifth season. She was also one of the Bond girls in A View to a Kill and starred in the movie Sheena. Midge is the flighty lady next door who is exploring the exciting world of feminism. So I was kind of wondering what Donna likes. Perfume. Donna wears white shoulders. It's not just for shoulders, you can wear it anywhere. <laughs> Although the principal cast was quite large, it would grow larger still in later seasons, and it would also shrink when some of the actors departed. But the action was primarily driven by its main cast of teenagers, always ready to assemble in the foreman basement. The theme song of the series was a cover of the big star song, In the Street. The cover was originally performed by Todd Griffin for the first season of the series, but a new version was recorded by Cheap Trick that would be used in seasons 2 through 8. When a music video was released for the song, the cast even appeared alongside Cheap Trick. After the pilot was filmed, one of the few things still missing was the title for the show. Teenage Wasteland was out, as the show's creators couldn't get the rights to that from The Who. Several other titles inspired by popular music of the era faced similar problems, including such names as The Kids Are Alright. Eventually, that became Feelin' Alright but Fox didn't particularly like the sound of that. During test screenings of the pilot, audiences kept calling it That 70s Show. That's what the audience kept calling it. They had no clue what the title was. They just referred to it as That 70s Show. So we stopped fighting it and went with it. Point Place, Wisconsin, May 17th, 1976. 8.47 p.m. Location, Eric Foreman's Basement. This is how we're introduced to the gang of That 70s Show. Debuting in the real world on August 23rd, 1998, this first episode was called That 70s Pilot. We meet Eric, Donna, Hyde, and Kelso in the basement, with the latter three encouraging Eric to do his teenage duty and steal some beer from his parents, who are having a party upstairs. If my dad catches me copping beers, he'll kill me. I'm willing to take that risk. <laughs> As Eric goes upstairs, we get our first look at that 70s show's unique style with a first-person view from Eric's perspective. Is everybody good? I know, I know. Vienna sausages are so versatile. <laughs> One fun bit of trivia here is that we get the first appearance of Kitty's iconic laugh, a laugh that was done accidentally. We're in the living room, we're doing the big party, and I go over to the stereo and I go, and I say, well, I'm just feeling like little Tom Jones now. And then I laughed, and this laugh came out. <laughs> well, they cut the line, and they kept the laugh. And then I was sort of stuck with the laugh. I sort of went, oh, well, here you go. <laughs> we also get our first sign that Donna and Eric are into each other. You're getting a car? Have I told you how incredibly attractive you are, Eric? No. <laughs> you told me he was cute. No, I didn't. Well, I remember because you said not to say anything in front of Eric. <laughs> Eric, relax. We've lived next door to each other forever. You could have had me when I was four. <laughs> really? And there I was all day long on the hippity hop. <laughs> the Jackie and Kelso relationship is also established. 
I didn't invite you to the concert because I know you really don't like my friends. Did you tell them that? No. Michael, don't tell our private conversations to the people, Michael. We have to have private conversations. We also get our very first circle, which is how the teens on the show would gather while getting high. You couldn't show someone smoking pot on a TV show, but that 70s show got around this by moving the camera on someone just after they had taken a puff. That way it simulates a joint being passed around in a circle without actually showing the joint itself. You can even see the characters break into laughter a few times, which was kept in because it seemed authentic. They just have the giggles because they're high. The show had some fun with High Eric when he has to speak to his parents, and he finds out that he's getting the Vista Cruiser. This is another fun example of its creative style. <laughs> Future episodes would also take liberties with split screens and voiceovers and edits to create something that you often didn't see in sitcoms of the day. What? Out of chips! Now I am mad. I must shoot something! Not the littlest hobo! With a new set of wheels, Eric and his friends go out of town to a concert and get up to some shenanigans. But the key part of this episode happens at the end with a pivotal moment for Don and Eric. <laughs> what was that for? I just wanted to see what it was like. <laughs> what was it like? <laughs> you were there? <laughs> This first episode establishes the characters very quickly. We know who they are and how they relate to one another. This show will be primarily about Eric discovering his first love and rebelling against a domineering father. What also makes the show feel genuine is that, while you can certainly tell it's set in the 70s, the kids aren't slavishly following the trends to set up cheap jokes. They have their own tastes and the humor is built around that. Ouch, my nose! That's gonna be huge in the morning. Huge than my boobs? Well, bigger than the left one. <laughs> Why are we watching this without the sound? I am totally confused. In this example, Eric and Donna are mocking the Brady Bunch, but Jackie is a fan. It shows us that Jackie is into the trendy sitcoms of the day, whereas Eric and Donna are more outsiders to pop culture. Jackie is conventional, while Eric and Donna aren't. This is how the decade informs us about the characters rather than using the characters as a vessel to explore the decade. In other words, it's how it establishes itself as a character-driven comedy rather than a premise-driven one. It's also interesting how it reframes memories of the 70s. It's not a show from that decade after all, rather it's a show about what people from the 90s remembered about the 70s. And sitting here over 20 years later, we're even more removed from the era. As someone who wasn't alive in 1976, I have no idea if teenagers mocked the Brady Bunch or not, but I do remember what it was like to have my first kiss, which is a big part of why the show is so fondly remembered. Not because it captured an era, but because it presented memorable characters whose experiences transcended that time period. We get another example in the very next episode, Eric's birthday. Eric wants a cassette player for the Vista Cruiser, and not an 8-track player. The point is, I don't want an 8-track tape player. Then you won't get one. Oh, but honey, he wants one. No, I want a tape player, just not an A-track. So naturally, he gets this. I mean, yeah. It's an A-track tape player. I see that. Just what you asked for. You made such a big deal about it, I wrote it down. If a 17-year-old was watching this episode, would they know the difference between an 8-track and a cassette player? Here's a picture of both of them. A lesser show would have had the characters hold up a cassette player and make a comment about it being cutting-edge technology, never to be surpassed. That might get a chuckle, but it's a laugh you probably wouldn't remember. On that 70s show, it's not about laughing at the technology of the past, it's about laughing at growing up with parents who don't listen. That's something you can laugh at and relate to, and it's what makes this show particularly memorable. Eric's birthday also introduced another important first, Eric's sister Lori, played by Lisa Robin Kelly. Hello, Lori. <laughs> Red treats Lori a little differently than he does Eric. Lori, right, you're not uh, driving a Vista Cruiser. That's old and undependable. It could break down, you'd be at the mercy of any maniac who came along. That's okay for Eric. <laughs> but you're taking a Toyota. And I should mention, not every scene in the circle involved passing a joint around. 
That 70s show ran for eight seasons, though it only took place over roughly three and a half years. If you've ever been watching an episode and wondering when exactly you are, at the end of the opening credits when we see the Vista Cruiser's license plate, the renewal sticker tells us which year the episode is set in. This does make things a little awkward at times, as the timeline, particularly because of episodes with holidays, doesn't always line up. By homing in on each year, we can split the series up into four distinctive eras, and as we follow the lives of these characters, we'll see how the series gradually evolves. That 70s show spends only a brief stretch in 1976. In fact, only the first 12 episodes of the series take place in that year, before we move on to 1977 for the second half of the first season. One exception is episode 23 of season 1, which also takes place in 1976, in part because the order of the episodes was shuffled around while airing. This creates a few instances of confusing continuity, like Eric mentioning he and Hyde hadn't yet sprayed the water tower when we had seen them do just that that in the episode that aired the previous week. In addition to Eric and Donna's love affair, one of the big overarching themes in these early episodes is the precarious economic spot of the Foreman household. I've noticed that the pop selection has really went downhill since your dad got laid off. He's not laid off. He's just part-time. <laughs> and shut up. When the president comes to visit Point Place, Red is selected to ask the president a question. When he's given a question, rather than being allowed to ask his own, Red gets frustrated. A man has to stand up and be heard. I will not sit quietly by while everything is taken away from me. They took my job, my stability, and now they want to take away my right to free speech. You still have the Toyota, it gets great mileage. <laughs> It being 1976, the president right now is Gerald Ford, who assumed office after Richard Nixon resigned. This is when Nixon was on the cusp of being impeached and removed from office. What Red is feeling here is not just the indifference towards him from the federal government, but the general sense that America is leaving him behind, and that the country is corrupt from top to bottom, letting him lose his job as he's lost in the shuffle of the marketplace. What Red doesn't realize is the America he thought he knew as a boy wasn't a whole lot better, or at least not as free as he imagined it was. It's not so much that the country has changed as he just happens to be one of the people it's left behind. And the show doesn't make it such a big secret here that the problem lies much with a business class that uses people like Red as pawns. Bob, a member of the local community of businessmen, represents that world when he thinks of Red to ask the president a question. The important thing is to choose the right person, you know? A working class guy, your average Joe. I guess someone you and I would call a loser. <laughs> so of course I thought of you. Although Red planned to go off script at the presidential event, at first he seems a bit too nervous to ask any question at all. But after Eric makes a rash political protest by streaking the president, Red finds his nerve. Hey Jerry, here's my question. How the hell could you pardon Nixon? <laughs> Sometimes a man's gotta do what he thinks is right. These early episodes probably have Red at his most relatable, perhaps because of the economic insecurity that people are feeling in the present day, and something that people in the 90s might have felt as well when this show was first airing. And back then, it was when a booming economy was raising questions about who the economy is exactly booming for. One of the early plot lines, just to get the obvious out of the way, was having the gang go disco dancing. One fun part of this episode has Fez noticing one of the disco's inspirations. When do they play the disco music? This is disco music! No, no, this is samba! And Fez is revealed to be a fantastic dancer. Although Fez is a mystery throughout the series, it's early on when he's at his best. He seems like he's genuinely from somewhere, with a history and culture that only seems especially foreign in contrast to the relative ignorance of the largely white small town in middle America. There's something sweet seeing Fez struggling to understand American culture, and it offers members of the audience less familiar with 70s culture the chance to have it explained to them in a less heavy-handed way. Ah, they're finally getting off the island. What do you want me to do? <laughs> No, Fez, they're not getting off the island. But they have a coconut radio. What could go wrong? Of course you'll goof something up, Gilligan. Oh, Gilligan. There will be much more to say about Fez as the series progresses, but over time this innocence would vanish, and we'd be left with another early trait he showed in these episodes, being a bit of a creep. Please stop touching each other. 
It gives me neat. <laughs> The early episodes of That 70s Show also featured a landmark moment in TV history. In the episode Eric's Buddy, we meet Buddy, played by Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Eric's lab partner and one of the most popular kids in school. As their friendship grows, so does a misunderstanding, at least in Buddy's mind. And I feel like I'm playing this part, right? But it's not me. Mm-hmm. This is the first kiss between two men on network TV. Although sometimes that's credited to the Dawson's Creek episode True Love, Eric's buddy beat it to air by about five months. Eric being straight has to turn Buddy down, but the two agree to stay friends. If you don't want to be my lab partner anymore, then I'll, I'll understand. No, no. Oh, I didn't mean it like that. Um, look, we're still friends. Really? Yeah. And as the rules of sitcoms go, with a one-off guest star destined to be a one-off guest star, we never see Buddy again. At the time, this moment was heralded as a very positive depiction of a gay character. Buddy is cool, popular, and charming, not at all living up to any of the stereotypes of gay characters you might see on other shows, including this one in later seasons. The episode was even nominated for a GLAAD award as an outstanding TV individual episode. What's probably most notable about this moment is the audience's reaction, though, which is genuine shock from something they likely hadn't seen on a TV show before. Looking at it 20 years later, it seems almost tame compared to modern television, and it's a little disappointing to see Buddy play the token gay character who's there and gone now that the gay episode has been handled. It does reveal how little representation there was for gay characters on TV at this time, and perhaps what makes it age less gracefully is that it was on the cusp of a growing change in television which would see an increase in the number of gay characters on sitcoms. Buddy wasn't even the first character to appear on the series, as the pilot featured a gay couple, one of whom was a mechanic who traded a car part for concert tickets to the gang. Hey guys, then they dated a man. I'm okay with it. You're so cool to be okay with it. <laughs> Aside from these brief moments, the romance on the show was overwhelmingly heterosexual and one of the top concerns for its characters. Jackie and Kelso, being the established couple in the beginning, struggle to stay together. Or rather, Kelso is constantly trying to convince his friends he's about to dump his very annoying girlfriend. I gotta get a gift for Jackie! Who I'm breaking up with. <laughs> Knowing that Mila Kunis is only 15 throughout season 1 does make a few of the scenes a bit uncomfortable to watch, though because of the age difference between her and Ashton Kutcher, who was 20 at the time, most of the scenes where they're making out happen hidden behind car seats and other obstacles. Kelso's attraction to Lori in particular reveals he's not entirely committed to Jackie, and while Lori is no stranger to hooking up, Kelso's chances largely only exist in his head. Hello, Lori. Kelso. Of course, the biggest romantic plotline in the early episodes is the Eric and Donna relationship. It's immediately obvious from the first episode that these two would be getting together, so a bit of intrigue is thrown into the middle of it, with Hyde attempting to create a love triangle. A few flirtations from Hyde doesn't really do much to interrupt Eric and Donna getting closer, often in the most embarrassing way possible. As the year comes to an end, Eric and his friends hold their own Christmas party. It's about as close as Hyde gets to winning Donna's affections. This is great. Hey, what is it? It's a picture of me and Hyde. Yeah, it's, it's me and you in fifth grade. I've had it in my drawer forever, so I just framed it. <laughs> that is so sweet. Yeah, that is so sweet. <laughs> Even with this magical Christmas, Eric and Donna still seem like the couple destined to be together, and by the time Valentine's Day rolls around next year, this subplot is put to bed, with Hyde backing off after being rejected by Donna. So, Foreman, man, I'm sorry about tonight with Donna. <laughs> well, and for taking your dinner. <laughs> so, be cool, man. Yeah, man. We've gotta be. Look, we've been friends since kindergarten. No girl's gonna come between us. 
Throughout 1976, the innocence of the series is apparent with Red losing a kind of innocence when he learns that America isn't the land of dreams he once imagined. Through Fez's ignorance of his new homeland, in Eric and the gang learning about gay people, and Eric and Donna discovering their first love. The world is becoming a more complicated place, and the idealized version of the world these characters imagined is fading away. This is a common theme in most coming-of-age stories, but it feels even more prominent on that 70s show because we in the audience have the advantage of knowing a future that these characters don't. We may not know what happens in our future, but we know at least some of the major events that will happen in theirs. What the hell? <laughs> it's the Russians. <laughs> And their ignorance of those facts helps make the impression of innocence even more pronounced. Once Hyde stepped aside from the Eric and Donna pairing, it gave his character the chance to grow into something more interesting. In the season 1 episode Career Day, we meet Hyde's mother Edna, played by Katie Seagal. She works as the school's lunch lady, and she has a troubled relationship with Hyde. Always a smart-ass, Stephen, just like your father. You know what? One thing he did do right, he left. All right, that's right, Stephen, just walk. Just like everyone else. Edna's riding me again about being just like my dad, so I just took off. <laughs> Didn't your dad uh, take off? Mm. Irony, far out. Steven, he came back. You don't know what that means to me. Oh yeah? Yeah. This is sadly the last we see of Hyde's mother, Edna, though he would have a number of father figures throughout the years, including Red. In the episode Punk Chick, When Hyde Falls for Chrissy, played by Jade Gordon, he's tempted to follow her to New York, where she plans to start a punk band. Mother of God, I think I love you. <laughs> Love is an outdated concept used by industrialists to keep women subservient. <laughs> I am an Red and Kitty try to convince Hyde not to run off to New York. The people are rude. <laughs> and you have feelings. Without that sheepskin, you are nothing. And not the kind of nothing that you are now. <laughs> and even lower, more pathetic nothing. And so does Eric. Hi, we're finally getting old enough to do some serious damage to this town. <laughs> Remember we're gonna paint that pot leaf on the water tower? <laughs> Vandalism, while tempting, is not enough reason for me to stay. Plus, you can do that without me. But we won't do that without you. <laughs> Hyde, you're the reason we do so many stupid, senseless things. <laughs> Hyde eventually decides to stay in Point Place. You're not going. No. Although it's never made clear whose advice convinced Hyde to stay, we do learn that what Hyde is missing most in his life is the good influence of the foreman household, something that becomes essential when Edna runs off with a trucker at the end of season one, leaving Hyde without a home. Didn't there used to be a TV there? <laughs> yeah, I pawned it. You pawned your mom's TV? Hyde, she's not coming back. Okay, she's not coming back, all right? Even though Edna's not coming back, Hyde rejects help at first. But Eric goes to his parents, who are struggling to afford the kids they already have. Well, you know, we could, we could just pop over there just to check up on it. No, I'm not going over there. That's final. I am not Santa Claus. <laughs> Ultimately, it's Red who has to step up and make the decision to help Hyde, with some encouragement from Kitty. Damn it! I am tired of being Santa Claus! <laughs> Steven, you get your together and you get your ass in the damn car. We're going. Now, damn it. Move it. Okay. And Hyde quickly makes himself the model son in the Foreman household. I must say all that studying really paid off. Oh yeah? What'd you get a D? No. A C minus. <laughs> What this consistently reinforces is that Hyde needs a stable family life, and in particular a father figure like Red to keep him on the straight and narrow path. It's a very old-fashioned message. A young boy needs a father figure. In the second season, Hyde even gets a second quasi-father figure in Leo, played by Tommy Chong, who gives Hyde a job. I got three or four more of these little huts somewhere. <laughs> Hey, listen, if you see one of these sets, would you give me a call, man? Or even better, I could take a picture. 
Whoa! A picture of a photo hat. Hey, that'd be like art or something, huh? The money goes towards the noble goal of supporting the Foreman household. Look, I got a job, all right? I don't want to hear anything about we're fine because I know money's tight around here and you won't let Foreman work, so just take the money and drop it. Hyde is the model wayward child, taken under the wing of a strong father who sets him on the right path, and by season two, he's slowly transforming into a respectable member of society. It's the sort of arc you might see in a family drama from the 70s, though thankfully that 70s show doesn't fit so neatly into that sentimental cliché. In the season two finale, Moon Over Point Place, Jackie is busted for holding marijuana, and Hyde takes the fall for her. The bag is mine. Come on, cheerleader, dirtbag. Okay, man. And then Red finds out. For possession of what? Son of a bitch! Red threatens to kick Hyde out, but Jackie eventually takes responsibility for what happened, and Hyde is allowed to stay in the Foreman household. Hyde was on a promising path, but to save Jackie, he throws himself in harm's way. What's particularly interesting is how he does it, though. He calls himself a dirtbag, and in some ways, Hyde still sees himself like that, in spite of all of the work he's done on improving while living with the Foremans. The Foremans can take him in and give him a home and give structure to his life, but in his heart, he still sees himself as an outsider. Hyde is a strong representative for 1977 because if 1976 was about the loss of innocence, 1977 is about finding this new sense of home in a strange new world. Only Hyde has felt that way through most of his life. As much as he had hoped his mother would pull herself together and be a better parent, going so far as to be the bigger person and apologize first when they fight, he ultimately can't get her to be the mother he needs. And when the foremans offer him a new home, he can't see himself as a part of it. At least, not right away. The show's answer, at least in this year, takes the shape of Bud, Hyde's father, played by Robert Hayes. He returns to Point Place and, after he's discovered by Hyde, tries to make amends for abandoning his son. Wow, Bud. Doing great now, huh? Color TV? I remember when I was a kid, I didn't even have a father. I got no excuse. I was a jerk. <laughs> I've been a jerk my whole life. And all I can do is tell you I'm sorry and hope that you'll believe me. But even if this seems like recreating the childhood he lost, there are hints that this won't last either. He's got an extra room. That's cool. Yeah. So if you ever want to, you know, come by or whatever, you know, not using the extra room. Yeah, the rents do, but they don't evict you for like three months, so I still got two days. <laughs> so you looking for a loan, bud? Oh, crap. There is this strange episode where Red tries to teach Bud how to be a better father, though. Steven doesn't need another friend, Bud. Steven needs somebody to ride his ass. It seems as though the answer to Hyde's feeling of alienation is more strict fathering, from a blood relation this time. But as we'll see in later years, Hyde's life is not so easily fixed with that, and his rebellious streak isn't something that needs to be disciplined out of him, but rather channeled into something more productive, such as protecting a friend, the way he stood up for Jackie. Jackie and Kelso had had something of a rocky year in 1977. In the very first episode of that year, season one's ski trip, Jackie breaks up with Kelso after finding out he was making out with Pam Macy. They get back together by the end of the episode, though, but this would establish a pattern. Four episodes later, in the episode titled The Pill, Jackie has a pregnancy scare. After Kelso melts down in response, they break up again, only to get back together in the episode Prom Night. I miss you. I miss you too. In season two, their relationship is tested once again with Eric's sister Lori becoming a part of the main cast. She takes an interest in Kelso and his new van. Listen, Lori, uh... I, I don't think you should be in here. I mean, I, I know we've made out a couple dozen times. <laughs> Twice. Okay. This isn't Lori falling for Kelso, though. It's something a bit more basic than that. Oh, sweet Kelso. You're a tool and I will use you when I please. <laughs> okay, baby. Okay. Much of the season then focuses on Kelso trying to balance dating Jackie with cheating on her with Lori. You want to shift? It's an automatic. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise! 
While Kelso was clearly the bad guy in all of this, he might be mistaken as being a hapless fool being used by Lori. Eventually, the truth comes out in Kiss of Death. Kelso has finally realized that the genuine love of Jackie means more to him than the lust represented by Lori, and he decides to break things off with her. You know what I'd like, though? Just one last goodbye kiss. Um, okay, well, sure. <laughs> Michael! Jackie! Wow, how ironic, huh? <laughs> While Lori is always insufferable, it's pretty clear that this is, and has always been, Kelso's fault. More than just being a fool, he actively hurt Jackie, and when she ends things with him, it looks like it will be sticking around for longer than an episode or two this time. Please take me back. Oh, Michael. No. You, no, you know what? We're through. Forever. Whoa, didn't see that coming. <laughs> and so ends the show's first relationship. A dog, Michael, a dirty, dirty dog. You are an idiot, and science is stupid. I have had it with you. You are weird, and I'm going home. If you're not telling the truth, I will find out. Because I'm smart, and you aren't. I am in love with a doofus. <laughs> All the memories. Jackie seemed like a challenging person to date, but it doesn't excuse what Kelso did to her. And with naive Kelso being the more affable character in the affair, it's interesting that he was the bad guy in the whole thing. Often in stories of infidelity, characters are more helpfully coded as heroes or villains of the story. But especially for a sitcom, the dynamic here is surprisingly not straightforward. It shows us how trust is broken by deeds rather than persona, and that someone's personality doesn't always tell you who they are as a person. At least, not entirely. Although it took many twists and turns to get here, Jackie and Kelso both get the chance to grow beyond the high school romance they had. Jackie moves on to other romantic interests, as the show teases her possibly dating Hyde or Fez, while Kelso tries to date Lori for real. This leads to some classic confrontations between the two ladies in the foreman basement. You better watch your back. Really? Cause you? She stopped spending so much time on yours. Burn! <laughs> hey, I'm sorry, I just got swept away by the super good burn. <laughs> Eventually, and completely unsurprisingly, Lori cheats on Kelso. Hey, man, what the hell are you doing? What? Oh, yeah, I should uh, probably go out through the window. <laughs> And he apologizes to Jackie. I don't know if you've made the connection, but there are a lot of similarities between what Lori did to me and what I did to you. <laughs> Except you and I were really in love. And you trusted me. Jackie, I let you down. And I'm sorry. Kelso's apology is pretty good, and in time he realizes that the only woman he wants to be with is Jackie. Jackie still might be interested in him, so she tests Kelso to see if he's truly changed. I appreciate the offer and all, because you're like, really hot. <laughs> but the only girl I want to make out with is Jackie, so... Oh, what? You did it! You did it! You passed the last test! And we're back where we started. Albeit with Kelso seeming to have grown up a little, and Jackie deciding to forgive him again. Although it's nice enough for Kelso to have become a more mature character, it does reveal that the show wasn't entirely sure how to evolve Jackie. While her being a year younger than everyone else in the gang, and two years younger than Kelso, who has held back a grade, it still seems odd that she's only been able to identify herself based on whether or not she's dating someone. She's of course rich and popular, but after the first season, these aspects of her character seem less important, as neither are quite as relevant when she's hanging out with the other characters, aside from being fodder for a few jokes here and there. Much in the same way Hyde's answer to the alienation he felt was to end up back with his father, Jackie and Kelso respond to their separation in the same way. Fear of the new normal certainly makes sense, and it reveals that perhaps these teens aren't quite ready to step into adulthood just yet. They've still got some growing to do. Another reason Jackie and Kelso may have been put together is because Lisa Robin Kelly, who played Lori on the show, exited the series in season 3. Although her character was adding a lot to the show, the actress was having personal issues behind the scenes. In an interview with ABC in 2012, she described having had a miscarriage at the time and then falling into alcoholism. Although she would briefly return in season 5 for four more episodes, Lori would eventually be recast, with Christina Moore taking over the part. 
Eric and Donna's relationship becomes official in the second half of season 1, with the first step being Eric giving Donna his class ring. And in season 2, they finally say they love each other. I love you, Eric. <laughs> I love cake. <laughs> well, Eric says it eventually. I love you. I love you too. And after nearly two seasons, the two of them finally do it in the episode the first time. Eric and Donna have largely made the journey comfortably, and 1977 is probably their best year as a couple. They handle most challenges that come their way pretty well, with my favorite being the episode Eric's Panties, where Donna finds a mysterious pair of panties in the back seat of the Vista Cruiser. She assumes they belong to Shelly, a girl who had been flirting with Eric, played by Mamet Patterson. Donna, look, you have to believe me. I have no idea whose panties those are. Donna! Those panties are mine. Eric! <laughs> When you've been together as long as your father and I have, you need to do creative things in creative places. Even with things mostly going well for the two, the third season's episode, Baby Fever, did give us a hint that Eric and Donna might not have the happy ending they imagined. Donna, the only reason I thought you'd stay home with the baby is because only every woman has done it for the entire history of time, so don't be mad at me, be mad at your foremothers. <laughs> And the comfort Donna gets from Midge has an ominous undertone. It's not like I never wondered what my life could have been like if I hadn't married your father. I mean, I... well, I could have been a doctor. Exactly. Or a dancing girl. <laughs> you and Eric are so young. The chances are you're not going to end up together anyway. <laughs> One interesting part of why Donna and Eric clash is that Donna wants more for herself than to be a housewife, unlike what happened to her mother, whereas Eric is modeling his future on what he sees with his parents. One of the keys to understand Donna and Eric's mindsets is to look at what their parents were going through in the same year. In 1976, Red was struggling to put food on the table as his hours were reduced at the auto plant. In a special Star Wars themed episode called A New Hope, we find out that the plant is going to be shut down for good, leaving Red without a job. This leaves the foremans in a rough spot. You know we're gonna get through this. Yeah, I know. Oh heck, we've been through worse times than these. Just for the fun of it, kidding. When was that? Well, I don't know. While it seems dire, Red gets an opportunity to turn things around when a Price Mart opens up in town. Don't you think that Price Mart's new supervisor deserves a drink? Yeah! On the other side of the property line, Bob is threatened by the arrival of Price Mart. These giant corporations come into town, they destroy little businesses like mine. They're evil. While Red may not seem like the best of friends to Bob, his reasons for going after that job make a lot of sense, as his family heads closer to going broke. Well, if it isn't Benedict and Arnold. Bob, I needed that job, and if you can't get that, well, I'm sorry, you're a dumbass. For Bob, though, Price Mart is the beginning of the end of his appliance store, and it goes under in season three. Your dad's appliance store is going out of business because he can't compete with Price Mart. Red, throughout his life, is at the mercy of the big businesses that come and go through Point Place. When the auto industry started outsourcing abroad for its parts, his plant got shut down and he was out of work. But when a big box retail store opens up, he suddenly has a job again. There isn't much room for him to decide where his life will go. At first, it seems as though Bob is the wiser person, investing in his own business and providing comfortably for his family. Until a big business comes in and turns it all upside down, leaving him without a job. Bob isn't quite the master of his destiny that he imagined, and even though he was a big wheel in the business community in Point Place, there are always bigger fish outside that very little pond. When we look at Eric and Donna, we can see their parents' outlooks reflected in their own lives. Eric has a more traditional conservative vision for his future because the system seems to be keeping his family afloat. Even if times can get tough, eventually it all works out. For Donna, her father's failure reflects a system that shows how a bigger force can wipe you away in an instant. This is compounded by Eric growing up as a boy and Donna as a girl. Eric is comforted in the idea that society has been built for someone like him, and challenges are temporary roadblocks, whereas Donna knows she has an uphill battle. 
When luck turns against Bob, she's reminded of a system that doesn't work for her, but rather only values her as a commodity. And when she looks at her mother, she sees someone whose opportunity at being something other than a housewife taken from her because she happened to get pregnant at a young age. So Eric, assuming he and Donna will just get married and settle down, while Donna dreams of something more, explain why there might be some confusion on where the relationship is headed. The irony for Eric is that he's wrong to have any faith in the system. Red getting a job at Price Mart, saving their family from financial peril, is pure luck. To be fair, Red had originally been offered a job as a cashier, and then insisted on a management position. But even with the benefit of his hard head, that opportunity would be nothing if Price Mart hadn't chosen to open up a store in Point Place. But Eric does have the opportunity to learn better, and that comes in the shape of his mother Kitty. Kitty works as a nurse at a nearby hospital, a job she took on to help the family with their finances. When Eric goes to the hospital with Kitty for career day, he learns just how capable she is. You know, your mom does the work of five nurses. This place would fall apart without her. And she's so funny. Oh yeah, she is. Um, wait, no, she's not. <laughs> and even more than that, Eric learns about one of the real challenges of working at a hospital. I mean, poor Mr. Anderson. Look, you knew this guy, Mom. How do you deal with all of this? While Eric and his mother would bond as the seasons went on, Kitty never quite becomes the force in the foreman household that Red is. If her job as a nurse symbolizes her strength, it's telling that she seems to quit and go back throughout the series, which reflects an insecurity in her status. That insecure status manifests in Eric, who has a less than perfect understanding that Donna wants to be more than a homemaker. Eric assumes his mother is happiest at home, when we'll see in later seasons that isn't really the case. For Donna, her faith in relationships is also reflected in how her parents seem to be falling apart in theirs. As Midge empowers herself through attempting to understand feminist theory, Bob grows worried that it may make her want to start becoming a radical and do something crazy like get a job. Well, I'm the man of the house and I say you're not going to community college. You can't tell me what to do, you big ass. <laughs> Midge's interest in feminism is a bit fleeting though, as she and Bob seem to drift with every fad that comes their way, from fondue to nudism. They used to be normal. <laughs> what the hell happened to them? Well, I don't know. How can she not eat meat? That can't be healthy. And over time, we find out that Bob and Midge just aren't happy together. Donna, your mother was fine until she met those feminists and started thinking. <laughs> Excuse me, Bob, but I'm not happy! With her parents constantly fighting, the last thing Donna wants to create is a mirror image of them with Eric. And without that positive role model for a happy relationship, she wants to create something new and different. Although feminism was a passing interest for Midge, it seems to have had a stronger impact on Donna. Hyde, Red, Jackie, and Kelso all respond to the changes of 1977 with a return to the familiar. For Hyde, it's a chance to have a father again. For Red, it's back to working as management in the corporate machine. For Jackie and Kelso, it's giving their troubled relationship another chance. But for Bob, he can't go back to running a store again, and he and Midge aren't returning to the happy marriage they once had. So Eric and Donna have to ask themselves where they are in this year of change. Going down the familiar path of Eric's parents, or finding something completely new. 1978 brought with it some major changes to the show. Eric is slowly realizing the relationship he has isn't like the one his mom and dad have. Eric tries to escalate his relationship with Donna by giving her a promise ring in the season 3 finale. As Donna considers the meaning of this promise ring, she realizes she's not ready for the commitment it represents, so she gives it back to Eric. The important thing is when you see yourself in Paris or wherever, I'm there, right? Right? I don't know. Not always. We're together now. Isn't that enough? No! I mean... I mean, damn, Donna! If you can see a future for yourself without me, and that doesn't like break your heart, then I, I, we're not doing what I thought we were doing here, and you know what? Maybe we shouldn't even be together at all. Are you breaking up with me? Well, are you getting back that ring? Yes. Then... 
Yes. It's ironically not the present that breaks up Eric and Donna, but the future and their different visions for it. Donna wants to see where life will take her, and Eric wants to start building a life he already imagines. And ironically, they end up heading into a direction neither of them wanted. After the breakup, Eric is left shattered in a way that anyone who's gone through their first breakup can probably relate to. Jeez, huh? You look like you've just been dumped. <laughs> Later on, Red actually offers some good advice. Listen, I'm going to give you a few days to pull yourself together. You can stay in bed and sleep, watch TV, whatever you need to do. Thank you, Dad. The fallout of Donna and Eric's split would play out over several episodes, with the two of them learning how to live among one another after some really nasty post-breakup feelings. But this moment where Eric and Red bond is surprisingly sweet and in many ways emblematic of how the two have been growing increasingly close over the previous seasons. Sometimes it took the shape of Eric standing up to Red. Now you screwed yourself when you didn't return those books. Now go! Okay. No. <laughs> Sometimes the bonding happened on a hunting trip. I think you're angry because life didn't turn out exactly the way you wanted it to. And, uh... Maybe you think if you yell at me, I won't let life push me around too. You came up with that answer awful fast. <laughs> Eric and Red's relationship is built on Eric's rebellion while understanding who his father is, and Red trying to make Eric who he thinks Eric needs to be. By reconciling all of these things, Eric is able to grow himself. Red is both a role model and cautionary tale for Eric, and he takes the lesson to heart, but Red is also a father to him that offers comfort and love when he needs it the most, like in that moment after his breakup with Donna. But there is something in the relationship that's shaped by the less enlightened era Red comes from, where emotions aren't so easily shared, such as when Red lies about crying after being dumped. Everything was great, but when things started getting serious, she dumped me. Man, that, that hurt like hell. Did you cry? No. <laughs> oh, Eloise. Oh, Eloise. <laughs> it's a major event when Red tells Eric he loves him. I love you. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> when Kitty finds out Red was hopped up on medication, she tries to stop Eric from returning the gesture. Go to your room. Red tries to explain the rules around saying I love you for men. When he's drunk, when he's dying, or when he's in big trouble and it's the only way out. Other than that. Other than that, it's just a given. While the idea that love is simply understood is nice, but it's clear from the rest of this episode that everyone understands that saying it out loud means something too. Something more than that implicit understanding offers. That outward expression of emotion is not something Red can offer Eric. The relationship of a cold father to an emotionally needy son is an old trope, and by setting it in the 70s, maybe it seems more acceptable. But being a show from the 90s, it was aware of how limited this relationship could be, and watching 20 years on, it becomes more apparent. Fathers and sons should be able to say they love one another without slamming face first into this cliche of what masculinity should be. There's still a lot of positives between Eric and Red, but Something as simple as them being open with their feelings is a sad limit for what could have been a more meaningful relationship. 1978 brought with it the departure of Midge. Growing so frustrated with her marriage to Bob, she takes off for California. I can't believe she would just take off without even a hint or a warning. No warning? Dad, she was always saying I'm unhappy and I'm gonna leave. <laughs> I mean, that's just what married people say. Donna luckily has Kitty to be there for her as a mother figure. But it's been so nice having someone to talk to since my mom left. I know. Someone who understands what I'm going through. 
Behind the scenes, the reason Tanya Roberts left the show was to care for her husband, who had become terminally ill. Roberts would appear in later seasons in a handful of guest spots. We don't get nearly as much insight into how Donna handles the breakup, since the show focuses on Eric, but it's interesting that both of them turn to his parents for help getting through it, and the comfort they offer in some ways reinforces the idea of a happy ending in the future, that one day they'll find someone they won't break up with. They both try dating other people, with Donna dating Kelso's brother Casey, played by Luke Wilson. And Eric dates a few other girls, sometimes sneaking off with Red's new Corvette to attract them. None of these girls last long, and while Donna continues to date Kelso, Eric realizes he's still in love with her. And now, Donna, all of a sudden, it's like the day after we broke up. All over again. Casey is revealed to just be toying with Donna, leaving her heartbroken, so she runs off to California to be with Midge at the end of season 4. In the season 5 premiere, Eric goes to California to get her back. I love you, and I have so much to say, but I just... And a few episodes later, Eric and Donna get engaged. And the rest of season 5 largely see these two trying to win approval from everybody else for their decision to get married in their final year of high school. It's a very strange series of events when, in the space of roughly half a year, we go from Donna and Eric breaking up to getting engaged. In terms of real-world time, this played out on television over roughly a year and a half, which seems more reasonable, but the sheer volume of episodes crammed into each show's annual time span creates a real decompression of time. This can be understood as time feeling much longer when you're younger, and your teenage years seeming so grand and important that everything can change in the course of a few days or weeks. And two people can go from not knowing what their future might hold, to knowing they'll be together forever over the course of a few months. It also reinforces how quickly Eric and Donna are growing. They manage to gain a lot of maturity in their time apart, and through the process of trying to convince everyone that their engagement is a good idea, we see what feels like the ultimate conclusion of the Eric and Red dynamic. As a disapproving Red throws numerous roadblocks to stop the wedding from happening, Eric refuses to back down, and Red has one final confrontation with him. You stuck to your guns. And I admire that you're willing to go out on your own. You're a man now. And you have my blessing. Eric is now a man. And ironically, it wasn't by obeying Red that he got there, but by rebelling against him. And also by emulating him. Because Red Foreman is not a man who backs down, and now neither is Eric. It's a bit strange how this relationship stopped being about Eric and Donna and gradually became more about Eric and Red. Eric's path to adulthood meant he has to move beyond his father and grow into something better. It's an uplifting message that reveals that Red can be a role model but can't be a limit on who Eric can be. And Eric manages to make it to adulthood, not losing that sweeter, kinder, gentler side of himself. Donna's dreams of doing more outside of Point Place don't seem to come up as much in these episodes, and she doesn't think the marriage will somehow hinder that. The loss of Eric, her mother, and being messed with Casey has dropped her back into the arms of Eric, holding on to what certainty she can find in life. In some ways, this reflects the limited options of women of the era. If Donna represented this bold new feminist force ready to take on the world, a few bad turns are all it takes to leave her ready to move into a trailer and begin living the domestic life. Although she and Eric plan on going to college together, when Eric's plans change, so do hers, and she stays in point place. Comparing her and Eric, it seems Eric has the brighter future with the path to happiness he wants right there for him when he's ready to take it. Donna has to compromise for him. But all of this started happening in season 5 is important because that seemed like the season where the show became more cynical and less thoughtful in its depiction of its characters. Season 5, which starts in the summer of 1978, has a strange feel to it. The characters seem to behave in a more exaggerated way. Red has always been mean to all of Eric's friends, Fez included, but he seems nastier to him starting in this season, often drifting into outright racism. Thanks for the help. You seem to have a natural talent for handling luggage. <laughs> and speaking of comments like that, we'll see characters casually drop in gross stuff like this in random conversations. I'm starting to get into the Asian ladies. <laughs> I know what you mean, mystery of the Orient, I'm very sexy. <laughs> Characters seemed a bit flatter too. Eric, for example, started becoming far more nerdy in this season. 
In season 1, we found out he really enjoyed Star Wars, but in the following three seasons, it never really comes up. But starting in season 5, he's suddenly collecting action figures and getting very upset when Red makes a homophobic comment about Luke Skywalker. Luke Skywalker this, Luke Skywalker that. I'm sick of hearing about that little fruit. <laughs> Luke Skywalker is not! He and Leia, clearly, I... Eric was never particularly cool, but he also wasn't so aggressively nerdy. By the way, the future has some bad news for Eric about the Luke and Leia thing. Red becomes increasingly patriotic in this season, even for some reason becoming a Nixon defender. Thank God for the honest ones like Richard Nixon, huh? <laughs> What did you say? I, I said that Nixon was framed and Kennedy was a commie? That's right. While Red always had a degree of patriotism in him, this is a far cry from the Red Foreman who confronted Gerald Ford about pardoning Nixon. Red's patriotism is now more of a cliché. The biggest change in season 5 though is with Kitty, when she mistakenly thinks she's pregnant, but is actually going through menopause. She reveals this in front of her parents, played by Betty White and Tom Poston. You wanna hear the big news? The doctor told me I started menopause! Kitty! Language! <laughs> this major moment in her life might have led to her character growing beyond motherhood and evolving into someone different. And while we do see some nice moments between her and her parents, what we get far more of in season 5 are a series of bad menopause jokes. I may have been a little irrational today. A little? Shut up! <laughs> Season 5 flattened its characters into cliches, making the dynamics less compelling than they were in earlier seasons. Part of this is that the show's premise is literally trapping them in this decade, meaning these characters are limited in the way they can grow or change. If they have to forever be teens, it doesn't really offer the opportunity to truly become adults. Not every change in Season 5 was a bad one, though as it did also include the introduction of Kitty's new dog, Shotzi. Got you a puppy. Shotzi even joins a very special circle. Does so anyone else think that Shotzi looks like Fez? <laughs> that dog is flying! At the beginning of season four, Hyde is back living with the Foremans. I moved back in. My dad got transferred. Transferred? He's a bartender. <laughs> Where'd he get transferred to? The jukebox? <laughs> he and my mom got back together. No way. No way, that's great. So, where are they? I can't tell you. Why not? Because they won't tell me. <laughs> they split on you? When Jackie pressures Kelso to get married, he runs away to California with Donna, finally ending his relationship with Jackie for good. With Kelso gone, Jackie goes into season 5 in a very different direction. Finally. Yeah, I thought they'd never leave. <laughs> this comes out of nowhere in the series, but there were a few hints leading up to this moment. As you saw earlier, Hyde took the fall for Jackie's pot possession, and between one of Jackie and Kelso's breakup, Hyde realizes he might have some feelings for her. And you're wondering, how can I open up to her when everyone I have ever loved have abandoned me? Am I even worthy of love? Well, you are, Stephen. But it doesn't get too much further than a kiss. A season and a half later, the two of them are exploring those old feelings for real. Although a new development, the spark for their relationship isn't terribly inspired. The summer totally sucks. There's nothing to do. But it does offer a few nice moments that speak to their history, like Jackie taking the fall for Hyde's paw possession. But when Jackie reveals she still has some kind of attachment to Kelso, it puts a strain on her relationship with Hyde. Get off my boyfriend! <laughs> oh yeah! <laughs> Although they smooth things over, Hyde's concerns get the better of him when he thinks he's caught Jackie and Kelso being intimate, when she was really comforting him after Fez had an erotic dream about Kelso. Hyde responds by cheating on Jackie. 
When the truth comes out, Hyde is left apologizing and Jackie breaks things off. I love you. Yeah, well, I don't love you. They get back together early in season six. I choose you. Wow. Yeah, I'm a good kisser. <laughs> if you note that when Jackie and Hyde got together, it was the summer of 1978. And now looking at Donna and Jackie enjoying an afternoon run at the pool, it's still the summer of 1978. Not literally, of course. The show has actually gone through an entire season where the gang finished their final year of high school. Yet, for some reason, the license plate still reads 1978. The kids of the show are trapped in the 70s and trapped in the show's cyclical storylines, in a sense making a commentary about how shows like these are limited. Instead of its characters growing over time, they're stuck. Even a show that was primarily designed to be driven by its characters is eventually trapped by its premise. Season 5's Trip to California had that 70s show trap its characters in its own version of Hotel California, which, by the way, was originally recorded in 1976, the first year covered in that 70s show. While Hyde continuously tries to escape his circumstances, constantly getting pulled back into where he was before, Jackie's struggle is a bit sadder. She only seems to ever be defined by who she is or who she isn't dating. While her character is very much the vehicle for discussing relationships early on, particularly for Donna, who needs someone to help her make sense of her feelings for Eric, Jackie doesn't get a chance to be much more than the relationship character. Jackie is very much carried by Mila Kunis' performances, who manages to make the character both lovable and obnoxious in near equal measures. She's a great part of the series, but the series doesn't do well enough to give her more varied things to do. One change I haven't mentioned yet is that Tommy Chong joined the principal cast in season four, but left the show in season five. Dear Hyde, ma'am, one day I stopped in Point Place for some gas. Before I knew it, eight years had passed. Whoa, that rhymes. <laughs> anyway, I should get home to my wife. Take care. You're a good kid, man. You're a good kid, man. The reason Chong left the show is because he was arrested for selling 7,500 bongs through a company he partially owned. He had to pay a fine of $20,000 and was sentenced to nine months in prison, but he would eventually return to the show once he had been let out. Another change we have to talk about is one that had been building for the last few seasons. Fez was starting to get really weird. As the last in the gang to lose his virginity, one of the running gags for Fez was how his perpetual quest to hook up with someone never seemed to work out. His dating life is a series of amusing fails, with my personal favorite being Caroline, who he briefly dated in season 3. Caroline is not quite as sweet as she first appears. So, is Fez like an amazing kisser? Jackie, don't make me blush. <laughs> I know she's only asked me because when she kissed him, he did this thing with his tongue. <laughs> you kissed Fez? Oh my god, it was so nothing, you had a stupid crush on me. SHUT UP! As you might have guessed, they break up. When Fez isn't failing in the dating world, he's making numerous jokes about how horny he is. And the more he jokes, the more the bar gets raised for what counts as creepy. Ooh, punch. Yeah, can I pour you some? No, thank you. But if you would like, you can bend over and put my gifts under the tree. Ouch. You okay? Fez! Fez, stop smelling the dress. Hey. I do this now, I do it at the reception. It's your choice. Fez starts off as a little weird, but as the audience get used to him, he has to say or do something strange to remind everyone that he's not like everyone else, raising the bar for what counts as weird. As the cycle repeats, the bar keeps getting raised, but at this point, it isn't as shocking because Fez has been building to this level for years. Fez also seems less like he's from a real place anymore. In the early seasons, whenever he speaks his native language, he defaults to speaking Spanish. Bésame, bésame mucho, como si fuera esta noche la última vez. But now we're getting jokes like this. Good day. No, but Fez. I stand and I can show you about a bar. 
Fez seems more like a cartoon character than an actual foreign exchange student. Fez's transformations is one of the only ones that felt gradual in season 5 though. Even if the other characters all have some degree of backstory, they still seem noticeably different as the show keeps them frozen in this 70s moment, while using a heavy hand to keep this impression that things are still fresh. But Fez was frozen very early on in the series as the series struggled to give him any lasting changes to his character. He was just weird, and he kept getting weirder and, as a consequence, creepier. As season 5 moves along, Lori makes her surprise return. And as Fez is under threat of deportation, having graduated high school, Lori does something drastic. I married Fez so he could stay in the country! <laughs> in the season 6 premiere, The Kids Are Alright, we found out that Lori's newly turned over leaf of being a better person immediately turns back over and she returns to being horrible leaving Fez to be her husband in name only as she dates around. Lori went on your honeymoon alone? Oh no, that would be crazy. <laughs> she took a friend Carlos along to keep an eye on her. And that's about it. We don't get much more out of this plotline, and Fez continues to putter along. One of the reoccurring themes for 1978 is how the characters have become frozen. If the previous two years were about discovering a new world, stepping out into it, and then saying maybe that wasn't such a great idea and heading back the way they came, this year was very much about being frozen in place, deciding that where the show needs to be is not in the brave new world of adulthood, but frozen in time in the waning years of the gang's teenage life. This is part of what makes it difficult for sitcoms to maintain an audience over time. One of their main draws is the original situation in the situation comedy. That 70s show was always meant to be character driven, which usually helps a sitcom overcome that hurdle. But when those characters aren't allowed to grow, it means they can't drive the series the way they were intended to. Because moving forward requires characters to grow, and that 70s show's very premise means these characters have to stay locked in their teenage years. Five years into the show should mean that Eric and Donna have gone off to college and be halfway through it, but they're still only just graduating high school. Hyde should be striking out on his own, but he's still learning lessons on growing up from the foremans. Jackie should be beyond her high school crushes, but she still hasn't even graduated yet. And Fez should be more than this strange foreign exchange student, but none of his arcs ever amount to more than half a season of antics. What the show does do well though is preserve the memory of who these people should be, much in the way its look back at the 1970s is preserving the memory of what that decade was in the minds of certain people who experienced it. Maybe that's why the show had such solid ratings throughout most of its run, because it was always about holding on to that nostalgic moment, where you can hang out with your friends from high school and never worry about them growing up and becoming completely different people. If sitcoms are comfort food, maybe that's the way that 70s show is best memorialized. One of the hallmarks of that 70s show was its frequent use of fantasy cutaways. That included parodies of pop culture from the decade. There were some visual quirks that predated these parodies though, with season 1 using tableaus of famous works of art such as The Last Supper and Nighthawks, but it was the Star Wars themed episode A New Hope that put characters in special costumes and sets and really got the parody ball rolling. From there on, there were dozens of other parodies, from I Love Lucy to Charlie's Angels. I Love Lucy is obviously from the 1950s, not the 70s, but it worked because it was something these characters were familiar with, and it was a necessity because as the series moved along, parodies from the 70s were harder to come by. It would be tough to include every single parody, so here are my top three. The soap opera parody in season 2's Van Stock episode was an instant classic for me. I am leaving you for Dr. Cloak. <laughs> or should I say... Eric's real father. <laughs> Why? He has a job. <laughs> what do you have, Red Foreman? What do you have? After Red discovers the gang is smoking up, we get a great Reefer Madness parody in the season 3 episode titled Reefer Madness. You Ben, you missed choir practice. Sorry, dollface, but now, thanks to marijuana, I'm incurably insane. And the Happy Days parody in Jackie Says Cheese is double fun because it also makes a sly reference to jumping the shark. Fez, you jumped that shark and you're not even wet. <laughs> That's cause I'm cool, la mundo. Ay. <laughs> One 
One of the biggest changes in 1979 was Hyde learning that his father isn't the man he thought he was. At the start of Season 7 in the episode, Let's Spend the Night Together, we finally meet Hyde's father, William Barnett, often shortened to WB, played by Tim Reed. I'm William Barnett. I'm Stephen's father. <laughs> oh. At first, everyone is a bit unsure of how to talk to a black man. Hey, you know what show I love? The Jeffersons? <laughs> Dynamite, right? <laughs> I know Might is from Good Times. Oh. Well, I watch them all. I mean, I don't discriminate. Considering this is a small town in Wisconsin in 1979, it makes some sense that no one on the show knows how to talk to a black person, as the town is almost certainly mostly white. But Hyde does take an immediate shine to his new father. I was afraid you were going to be a cop or something. I don't like cops. I don't like cops either. Hey, who do you think shot JFK? I don't know, because they don't want me to know. Check it out, man. I'm a chip off the old block. Although there's a little friction at first, the two eventually start forging a relationship with Hyde working at one of the record stores his father owns. The introduction of WB introduces a new dynamic to the mostly white show, though only in so far as we get a lot of jokes like this. Donna, this is... I'm Steven's father. I'm black, and it's okay. <laughs> Hyde also meets his half-sister Angie, played by Megalyn Echikunwoke. It is interesting to see the introduction of a black family that's not only wealthy, but so wealthy they're on a higher class level than any of the white characters. The impact of race on these characters doesn't really come up though aside from the many jokes about how they are, in fact, black. Though that might reflect how wealth offers some degree of protection from more common types of bigotry. None of the black characters are a big enough part of the series to really explore that issue though. What this means for Hyde is that he once again has a new father figure, his fourth of the series. It's not too difficult to parse that the show is telling us what a troubled young man needs is a father giving him some kind of guidance and structure. A lesson so important, it's repeated four times. Five if you count Eric and Red. And with Tommy Chong out of jail, the show brings back another father figure for good measure. I'm glad you're back, man. Feelings mutual, man. Hey, wait a second. You're Hyde, man! In season 7, we see Hyde and Jackie once again back together, only to break up once more, then get back together again, and then break up one last time. That last breakup is particularly galling as it happens with Hyde walking in on Jackie and Kelso, again, mistakenly thinking they slept together. This moment reinforces how cyclical the narratives on this show can get as they're trapped in this decade repeating the same mistakes over and over as their show gets extended long beyond its expiration date because of its need to make a profit for its corporate overlords. Or at least, that's how I suspect Hyde would phrase it. In season 8, we find out Hyde has permanently moved on from Jackie and married a stripper he met in Las Vegas. His new wife, Samantha, is played by Jude Tyler. The marriage doesn't last when Hyde finds out his new wife already has a husband. Heading into 1979, Kelso was making some major strides towards growing up. He had decided on the career path of becoming a police officer. I'm gonna be a cop! <laughs> Not too long after, when Kelso is trying to convince everyone he hooked up with Donna's friend Brooke, played by Shannon Elizabeth, the truth comes out in an unexpected way. Michael, I just found out I'm pregnant. <laughs> Although Brooke tells Kelso he doesn't have to be involved with the baby, since she doesn't see him as father material, Kelso eventually decides he wants to be a part of the life of his child when they're born. Brooke's mother, played by Morgan Bearchild, plans on taking Brooke to Chicago to raise the child. Maybe since I'm going to be at police academy, that you might want to have the baby in Chicago. You know, just so you have your mom there, just for now. When the baby is born, she's named Betsy. And eventually Kelso decides he can't stand to be away from his daughter, and after the police fire him, he moves to Chicago. Kelso's maturing is difficult to pin down. If having a career wasn't the path to adulthood for him, but being a father was, it does suggest the value of family over one's career, though the idea of Kelso being a cop is more a nightmare scenario than a standard career path. Kelso's departure was more likely triggered by Ashton Kutcher deciding to leave the series after its seventh season, although he would make a few guest appearances in season 8 to give his character a proper send-off. And Kelso leaves Point Place for good. Well, I guess it's time to go. So. 
Bye, Michael. After his marriage to Lori, Fez finally becomes an American citizen. He would go from working at the DMV to getting a job as a shampoo boy at a salon. And, of course, being increasingly weird and creepy. You will make love to her in a dark room. Halfway through, you will excuse yourself. Then I'll come in, pretend to be you, and finish the job. <laughs> and this is the stuff he talks about when he's not hiding in Donna's closet. Yeah, it's starting to get really weird with Fez. Jackie's life gets complicated after her father goes to prison, and Jackie is left to fend for herself. This eventually leads to her and Fez moving in together. For a brief moment, it seemed as though Jackie would have a story arc that wasn't about her dating life when she starts working in television for local TV star Christine St. George, played by Mary Tyler Moore. Hey, um, what do you think about my new beret? This is what I think about it! But the job doesn't last, and eventually Jackie's story intersects with Fez for yet another romance. And now there's Fez. Who, who's been after me for years and who's really very sweet. But I never paid any attention to him because, you know, he's foreign. <laughs> there are better reasons not to date Fez, mostly because he has no boundaries in impressing himself upon women. But one of the strange quirks about Fez's gradual change over the years is that it simply gets put in the bucket of him being odd. It was his character trait at the beginning of the series, and even though it's elevated dramatically to the point where he's creeping around in the closet of his friend, he's still covered by the odd foreigner label, and it's the second part of that Jackie has trouble with. Or at least she does for a little while, until she gets over it and decides to pursue Fez in earnest, heading toward the show's finale. In the final year of the show, Kitty's journey through menopause finished, and she went on another journey into heavy drinking. It's a far cry from the woman who once struggled with her need to nurture and how it led her to nursing. Post-menopause, most jokes from Kitty were about her drinking problem. Kitty, uh, what's for dinner? Well, the camera's off, so I'm having a margarita with salt. <laughs> you two are on your own. <laughs> Kitty going from being the mother who brings her kids cookies and cocoa to the one who spends most of her time mixing drinks for herself would be an incredibly sad character arc on most other shows, but it's played with some levity here. It does raise the question of what menopause did to Kitty's psyche, but that's never really explored on the show. Kitty's menopause and drinking reveal how tragedy is molded through the candy colors of a sitcom to make things seem brighter, and maybe they're doing the same thing with the whole decade of the 1970s. That could be why people love this show so much. It lets you smile through tragedy. It's good for coping. If it was too real, it would be too heartbreaking. If it wasn't real enough, it wouldn't resonate. The balance is key. In earlier seasons, I think the show did a better job of that. But even in later ones, it does attempt to strike some kind of balance. Red manages to find some new ventures when he stops working at Price Mart and ends up opening a muffler shop. You might wonder where Red got the money for a muffler shop, but he was creative with that. Bad news, I, uh... <clears throat> I spent your college money to keep the muffler shop going. Red struggles to keep the shop open when a rival store from a big chain opens up nearby. But luckily for him, they make an offer and Red decides to sell the muffler shop. They offered me a lot of money. Go to hell, muffler master! Actually, I accepted it. Thank you, muffler master! So now Red has enough money to retire. What might have been some bad luck hitting Red once again ends up in his favor since he's the guy who owned the muffler shop and not just someone who worked there. Although Bob wasn't quite so fortunate in previous seasons, Red does show one's odds improve if you can position yourself as the business owner than its worker. Although looking at this in totality, it really seems like business is something of a crapshoot. Maybe you'll succeed, maybe you won't. It all depends on whether or not big businesses come in and stomp you out of business or decide to buy you off. Although there is one consistent that remains true for all business ventures on this show, the only way Red could get into this position is that he had to sell out his own son's future. It certainly says something that all the major business successes on this show involve screwing over another person. The Eric and Donna saga continued with the wedding at the end of season 6 being called off when Eric got scared and ran away before it could happen. In part because he realized the wedding was keeping Donna from pursuing her dreams, since she chose to stay in Point Place to be with him instead of going to college. The pair spend season 7 together, unsure of how their life will move forward. Donna decides to dye her hair. The real reason for Laura Prepon doing this was because she needed to be blonde for an upcoming movie she was starring in called Carla. Eric spends most of season 7 trying to figure out what to do with his life, before finally settling on becoming a teacher. Since Red spent all of Eric's college money on the muffler shop, Eric needs to find some other way of paying for college. And he comes up with an unorthodox solution. There's this program where you go and teach an impoverished area for a year, and then they pay for your college. 
I signed up. That's, That's wonderful. So where then? Africa. <laughs> Africa, Wisconsin? Eric will be spending next year teaching in Africa. We don't know where exactly, and the show never quite goes into detail. We only know it's somewhere in the second biggest continent on the planet. I need these shots. Africa is very strict about these things. And they're not strict about anything. I mean, the women walk around with their hoo-hoo's hanging up. <laughs> There's something that needs to be addressed that occurs constantly throughout this series, particularly in the later seasons. Characters are increasingly ignorant or sometimes outright disrespectful and racist towards any culture outside of their Midwest bubble. This is excused by the context of the series, since it's just assumed that people in the 1970s were more likely to be culturally insensitive. While that may be true, that 70s show in its inception seemed to want to be a little more enlightened than that. For example, Fez being welcomed into the gang of friends was a gesture of kindness that was at odds with more ignorant characters such as Red, and while they often didn't understand his cultural references, as his oddness perhaps became too central a point of his character, there was a genuine attempt to not just make him a walking collection of stereotypes. Similarly, when the first season introduced gay characters, they resisted being tired cliches or harmful stereotypes, and the characters around them are far more accepting than one might expect from a group of straight teens in the 1970s. But by season 7, some of that care had faded away, and in the interest of letting us, the audience, laugh at the racism of the past in the presumed comfort that it doesn't exist in the present. Something that certainly isn't true and breeds a degree of complacency towards racial issues. When the show has its fun making fun of Africa in a broad context, it's nudging the audience with a knowing wink saying, isn't it great people aren't this ignorant anymore? When the truth is, a lot of people would struggle to come up with the name of African countries where Eric might be headed to. On the flip side, the ready acceptance of Hyde's new black family is lovely to see, even if, in the case of characters like Jackie, it's motivated by greed. So, like many things in the later seasons of the series, there is a generous mix of good and bad that complicates characters that, ironically, behave very simply. It's an uneven tone that speaks to the strange lens sitcoms use to make the words simpler, yet complex enough to be convincing. At least for a couple of laughs. As Eric prepares to head out to somewhere in Africa, he waves goodbye and is on his way east, across the Atlantic. So long, Point Place! <laughs> The real reason Eric has to leave the show was because Topher Grace had been looking to go beyond the series and would soon be appearing in movies. To replace him, the character of Charlie Richardson, played by Brett Harrison, was introduced. And when Harrison was offered the lead in his own show, The Loop, he was quickly killed off at the beginning of season 8. It feels so good to finally belong to something, you know? It's like the first day of the rest of my life. <laughs> A beer! <laughs> To replace him, the character Randy Pearson, played by Josh Myers, was introduced. Hey, I saw this Help Wanted sign outside. You still looking? <laughs> uh... When Eric breaks up with Donna over a letter, Randy becomes her love interest through some of season 8. The fan reaction to Randy was not great, and while Randy's presence wasn't the sole reason, ratings for season 8 were on a steady decline. Without Eric and Kelso, that 70s show just didn't have the magic it once had. It was then that the network decided to cancel it, with its final two episodes airing together, Love of My Life and That 70s Finale, ended the decade for good on May 18th, 2006. In the penultimate episode of the series, characters are quickly moved into place for the finale, so they can finally escape the 70s. Hyde is given a record store by his father. I'm giving you this store. Yes, you're the proud owner of the last remaining grooves. Holy crap, I own this place? Jackie and Fez get together. Fez, there is no one better for me than you. Like, I'm, I'm just sorry that it took me so long to figure that out. And we find out that Eric is coming back to Point Place. I'm serious. I'm finally going to get out of this town and do something with my life. Eric called. He's coming home. He's coming home. <laughs> Yeah, you're not going anywhere. The final episode of the series takes place, as you might expect, on New Year's Eve 1979. But the surprise return we get isn't Eric, rather it's Kelso. There you guys are. Kelso! Hey man, <laughs> when'd you get back? <laughs> man, come on, I'm not gonna spend New Year's without my friends. <laughs> come uh, on, it's like, it's like the turn of the century. <laughs> as everyone celebrates the coming New Year inside, Donna waits outdoors. Before finding out that Eric was coming back, she had already made up her mind to finally go to college, but with him returning, she can't bring herself to get on that bus out of town just yet. 
not without seeing him first. And as she reminisces about all the time they spent together, Eric returns. Happy New Year. Eric. Red was right. I am a dumbass. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> and we end the series with one final circle. Did you guys hear about that car that runs on water? It's got a fiberglass air-cooled engine and it runs on water, man! It's like we never run out of things to talk about down there. And we count down the end of 1979. Eric going away made his relationship with Donna so much more meaningful. They both understood what they were missing in a way that a breakup doesn't quite match when they see each other all the time. And it's that old saying of, if you love something, set it free. If it returns, it was meant to be. As the show sends everyone away for the new decade, it seems to be telling the audience that everyone is going to be okay. They'll all be fine no matter what might lay ahead. One touch I really liked was that the ending credits of the series are the same as the first episode of the series. The gang is singing Tom Rundgren's Hello, It's Me. At the end of the pilot, seeing this was an endearing introduction to these teenagers making their way through a decade that was only vaguely familiar to me. But here, at the end of the series, it's nostalgia for the beginning of a show that was built on nostalgia. That 70s show is about these kids driving down the street, taking their first step into the big new world. But... This show isn't about that journey in the new world. It's about being in that moment, on the cusp of that journey. It's why everyone in the series is trapped in high school, in their teen years, in the 70s. It's a memory of that moment that stretches for as long as the series can hold on to it, when you felt like the world was going to be something new and exciting. While it didn't always have the best grasp of its premise, it did have a firm hold on that feeling it wanted to evoke. And those final lyrics we hear from Hello It's Me sound even clearer. It's important to me that you know you are free, because I never want to make you change for me. The success of That 70s Show spawned a spin-off a few years later. Although a lot of the same creative talent was responsible for the show behind the scenes, that didn't manifest itself into another hit. That 80s Show debuted on January 23rd, 2002, to a warm response initially, but quickly sank in the ratings throughout its first season. It was quickly cancelled after 13 episodes. There are a number of reasons cited for why the show failed, leaning a bit too hard on gags about the decade instead of having characters drive the series. Also, people had less nostalgia for the 80s than they did the 70s, and the cast didn't quite have the same chemistry as the ones on that 70s show. Watching it again 20 years later, I personally didn't think it was as bad as I remembered it being, but it definitely doesn't have the magic of the original series it spun off of. One interesting bit of trivia about the series is that it stars a young Glenn Howerton who would go on to play Dennis in It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. It's rumored his character, Corey Howard, supposedly was Eric Borman's first cousin, but this never actually comes up in the series itself. On February 12, 1999, another That 70 Show program aired in England under the name days like these. This is a nearly identical remake of the American series, except subtly changed to move the show from Point Place, Wisconsin to Lutton, England. The scripts were kept nearly identical, aside from a few cultural references being changed, only the British cast didn't quite perform it with the same energy as the American one. Here's an example of two scenes and how they played out on each show. Speaking of, Lori, I could have sworn I saw a University of Wisconsin envelope sticking out of your bra. What's that all about? <laughs> What? Donna's on the pill. <laughs> what did you do? I could have sworn I saw a University of East Anglia envelope sticking out of your bra. What? Donna's on the pill. What have you done? <laughs> it's not quite the same, is it? British audiences weren't very impressed, and the show only aired 10 of the 13 episodes produced. Generic 
In October of 2021, Netflix announced they were producing a new spin-off of that 70s show titled That 90s Show. It would bring Kurtwood Smith and Deborah Jo Rupp in their roles as Red and Kimmy and Foreman back. The premise of the series was that Eric and Donna's daughter Leia was spending the summer of 1995 in Point Place. Aside from Smith and Rupp, the rest of the cast is made up of Callie Heverda, Ashley Ofterheide, Mace Coronel, Maxwell A.C. Donovan, Rain Doy, and Sam Morelos. Other original cast members slated to appear are Topher Grace, Laura Prepon, Mila Kunis, Ashton Kutcher, and Wilmer Valderrama, although as the time of writing this, it seems they'll only be making guest appearances. Running for 10 episodes and shot in the multi-camera style of the original, it's already been filmed and is currently waiting for its premiere date on Netflix. Topher Grace left that 70s show to star in Spider-Man 3 as Eddie Brock slash Venom. He would go on to star in a number of other movies as well, including In Good Company and Win a Date with Tad Hamilton. Most recently, he's been a part of the TV series Home Economics. Laura Prepon would appear in several TV and film projects following the end of that 70s show, most notably as the character Alex Vance in the Netflix series Orange is the New Black. Most recently, she and her husband celebrated the birth of their second child in February of 2020. Mila Kunis has been featured in several projects following the end of that 70s show, including Black Swan, Bad Moms, and voicing the character Meg in nearly 400 episodes of Family Guy. In 2012, she began dating her former co-star, Ashton Kutcher, and the two would eventually marry in 2015. They currently have two children together. Ashton Kutcher starred in a number of movies and TV shows, notably No Strings Attached, What Happened in Vegas, and he replaced Charlie Sheen on Two and a Half Men. He's most recently starred in The Ranch on Netflix, which ran for four seasons, split into eight parts. In his personal side, in addition to marrying Mila Kunis and having two children, he's also in the process of treatment for a recent diagnosis of vasculitis. Wilma Valderrama went on to appear on several TV shows and movies following the end of that 70s show, perhaps most notably as the character Nick Torres on NCIS. He's also currently cast as Don Diego de la Vega, better known as Zorro, in an upcoming Zorro TV series. Kurtwood Smith would continue his very prolific acting career with appearances on 24, Agent Carter, and doing voice work on a number of different animated projects. Although it was a role he had before that 70s show, I personally remember him most fondly for his role in the Star Trek Voyager 2-parter, Year of Hell. Deborah Jo Rupp has been working both on screen and on stage, including several productions on Broadway. One of her most recent high-profile roles was on the WandaVision series. She was also nominated for a Drama Desk Award for her portrayal of Dr. Ruth in the stage production becoming Dr. Ruth. Dawn Stark has been consistently working since the end of that 70s show, often with guest spots on a number of different TV programs. He also had several reoccurring roles on Hit the Floor and Marin. Tanya Roberts had largely stepped away from the world of acting following her departure from that 70s show to take care of her husband. Her final role was in 2005 in the TV series Barbershop. Sadly, on January 4th, 2021, she passed away due to complications from an advanced case of sepsis. Lisa Robin Kelly left the world of acting after that 70s show, only to briefly reappear in two shorts. She had a series of high-profile arrests related to substance abuse and domestic violence. She passed away on January 3rd, 2014, while in rehab, and her cause of death is reported as multiple drug intoxication. Tommy Chong has been working regularly since the end of that 70s show, including a reunion with his longtime partner, Cheech Marin, to revive their classic stoner duo of Cheech and Chong. In 2012, he announced that he was diagnosed with prostate cancer and was receiving treatment. As of 2019, he announced that he is currently cancer-free. In 2017, Danny Masterson had three separate allegations of sexual assault filed against him, and on June 17, 2020, he was charged with three separate instances of rape. He is currently scheduled to be criminally tried on October 11, 2022. This is the part of the retrospective where I give you all some parting thoughts to close this off, hopefully fostering some understanding of the good and bad of a classic series. Maybe one you might want to go watch yourself and come up with your own reading for, or maybe one you'd just be happy knowing a little more about. I want to try something a little different though with this one. While working on this video, one problem I could not solve was how to talk about Danny Masterson. Unlike Roseanne Barr or Bill Cosby, Masterson was not the driving force behind this production. His alleged sexual assaults happened in his personal life and seemingly didn't impact the production of the series. 
But even so, if you believe the women who have accused him, and I am inclined to do that, it makes it difficult to watch without that knowledge constantly floating around in your mind. While researching this video, I also learned one of the women who accused him, Chrissy Carnell Bixler, appeared in an episode of the series. What seems to be just a fun little throwaway line in an episode takes on a different tone when you understand the context behind it. There's also the claims that Masterson is being protected by the Church of Scientology, which is such a messy and complicated claim that I can't possibly do it justice in this video. There's lots of other resources, I'll link a few below if you'd like to learn more about this case. It raises important questions like, do the actions of this one man wipe out an entire series? That 70s show wouldn't be the same without Hyde, but it wasn't exactly his show. And the work of all those people being forgotten because of the actions of one man seems unfair. If you're someone who wants to enjoy the show in spite of knowing what's been alleged against Masterson, I think that's okay. But for some people, that just isn't possible. They can't watch this series without that knowledge, tainting it, and in some way undermining the experience. And I think that's okay too. People are allowed to have complicated relationships with art. And you're allowed to take what you want or skip the process entirely if you don't want to deal with it at all. Regardless of how you feel about that 70s show though, I do think what is very important is that all claims of sexual assault should be taken seriously and thoroughly investigated. Ultimately, I think that's far more important than whether or not you can sit down and enjoy a sitcom without feeling guilty about it. That 70s show's candy-colored nostalgia, holding on to that naive optimism of your waning teen years, it's a show that helps you remember the good parts of the past while forgetting the bad. Just remember to keep one foot in reality and get ready to face it again when you're ready to leave the circle. The ending to this retrospective is making me think there is a video that will one day need to be made about how to engage with art that was, at least in part, created by people who have done harmful and sometimes heinous things behind the scenes. Speaking of values though, if you think this video had any sort of value, do consider becoming a patron or a member like the lovely names you see scrolling up the screen. You'll have early access to videos in the future, and a little extra say on what the next sitcom I cover will be, and there are other little bonuses I throw in along the way. If you would like to support this channel in a non-monetary fashion, you can like, comment, subscribe, and do hit the bell for notifications. Thank you all so much for watching. And for sticking around to the end of the credits, I want to share one of my favorite jokes from that 70s show. This is Red counseling Eric after he accidentally ran over Donna's cat. Mr. Bonkers. You go over there and you say, hey, I'm a cat killer. I'm, mur <laughs> I murdered your cat. <laughs> but you try to say it with a straight face. 